What is the most agonizing experience you've ever had? Was it because of some great physical pain? Or was it because of something that you feared? Or maybe it was a very difficult decision that you had to make. We realize that we face many difficult situations as we live this life. In 2007, Samson Parker, a South Carolina farmer, cut off his arm after it became stuck in a corn harvester. Parker had been harvesting corn when some stalks got stuck in a set of rollers that shucked the cut corn. He reached in the still running machine to pull the stalks out, and the rollers grabbed first his glove and then his hand. He tried yelling for help, but there was no one near the isolated field. So for more than an hour, he tried to pull his hand free, only to have it pulled ever further into the machinery. He was able to reach an iron bar and jam it into a small uh, sprocket. Uh, that drove the rollers. However, the sprocket grinding against the rod threw off sparks that set the, dry, that set the dried up corn stalks and leaves on fire. That's when Parker knew he had to cut his arm off or he would die right there. Now I hope that none of us have to face an agonizing decision as he had at that in his life. But no matter how agonizing the situations we may face in life, none of us will ever face the great agony that Jesus faced for us. This morning we're going to see why Jesus was in such great agony, and we're going to see how he dealt with that great agony. So let's have a greater appreciation for what Jesus was willing to endure for us as we go through this passage this morning. And let's also learn from him how we should respond to the situations that we face in life. Our passage begins this morning with Jesus taking his disciples to Gethsemane. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we're going to begin with verse 32. Mark 14, verse 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. Well, after Jesus and his disciples had finished the Passover meal, they left Jerusalem and went to the Mount of Olives. They passed through the Kidron Valley, and the Mount of Olives was on the opposite side. And Gethsemane was on the slope of the Mount of Olives. Now, the word Gethsemane means oil press. So the olive orchard that they went to apparently had an oil press on the property. Now, most likely, Jesus had taken his disciples to this olive grove before because Judas is not with them at this time. He had gone to get the religious leaders so that they could arrest Jesus. So Judas apparently knew where Jesus and the disciples would be. It's not explained here, but this property may have been surrounded by a stone wall. And apparently Jesus leaves the, the main group of disciples near the entrance, and he goes and takes Peter, James, and John with him as he goes further in, as we see in the following verses, in verses 33 through 36. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So we see that after Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and went on into the olive grove, that he began to be very distressed. And it says he was troubled. Both those words are used in verse 33, distressed and troubled. And then he also says in verse 34, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. 
Now, the word that's translated deeply grieved is related to the word that we uh, have periphery. And here it has the idea of being surrounded by sorrow. And Jesus even says that he's grieved to the point of death. So his grieving is so great that he's almost to die. Now, these three words used together describe an extremely acute agony that Jesus was experiencing. Luke adds in his gospel, in Luke 22, verse 44, his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. So apparently the, the magnitude of Jesus' agony caused the capillaries just below the surface of the skin to dilate to the point that the blood burst out and then escaped through the pores in the skin and dropped down with the sweat on the ground. We also see in verse 34 that Jesus exhorts Peter, James, and John to keep watch. Now this word has the idea to be alert. And in verse 38, it's connected with praying. Then he goes beyond them a ways to begin praying alone. Now it's obvious that Jesus feels a need for communion with his heavenly Father. We also begin to see here why Jesus is in such great agony. First, Jesus asked that the hour might pass by. And then he asked the Father to remove the cup from me. So he's using these two words together here, somewhat synonymous, hour and cup. Now, it's possible that the word hour is even encompassing more than just the cross, maybe the things leading up to it. But they're both pointing to the cross. Now, the word cup was often used in the Old Testament to refer to God's judgment on sin. It was a symbol for that. So here it's obvious that Jesus is using it for God's righteous wrath, which is going to be poured out in judgment on Jesus as he hangs on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. So the prayer request that Jesus gives to the Father gives us a greater understanding about why Jesus was in such great agony. He knew he was going to be taking on himself the sins of the world, and he was also going to be alienated from the Father in a very short period of time. So, just think about this. How would you like to take upon yourself the sins or evil deeds of another person? That wouldn't be a pleasant thought, would it? How would you like to take upon yourself the evil deeds of the people in ISIS who are beheading people? That would be abhorrent to take upon yourself their evil deeds. Now you're owning them. Or how about taking upon yourself the evil deeds of a sexual pervert who preys on young children? That would be a horrible thought. Or how about taking upon yourself the evil deeds of someone who comes up with a scam that tries to swindle older people out of their life savings. Now, it would be horrible to think about taking those evil deeds, those sins of people upon yourself. But then how about multiplying that and taking upon the evil deeds of every person who's ever lived and who will ever live? Well, Jesus was willing to do this but you can see why that was not a pleasant thought for him. But I think possibly an even greater cause of Jesus' agony was the horror of being alienated from God the Father. Because he realized when the Father's righteous wrath was going to be poured out upon him the very next day, that would not be a pleasant experience. In fact, that may anticipate the cry that Jesus gave, uh, gives in chapter 15, verse 34, when he's on the cross. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now notice the term that Jesus uses for the Father here in verse 36. He refers to him as Abba, Father. Now, in our simple translation, we would use that word as daddy. It was an affectionate term. It was a term that children would refer to their father. Jews would never use this term for God because it was too intimate. They didn't feel like it showed enough respect for him. But 
Jesus used this term for the Father because they had experienced uh, fellowship together for all of eternity. They had this wonderful relationship. It was perfect in every way. But now Jesus realized he's going to begin to experience great suffering at the hands of the Father as the Father's righteous wrath was poured out on him as he paid the penalty for our sins. Now can you imagine how difficult it would be for you to experience extreme suffering at the hands of someone who has been your closest friend, that you have the closest relationship with? Well, that's what Jesus was going to be facing. We also see here in verse 36 that Jesus has his own will, but it's never opposed to the Father's will. We can easily see why Jesus wanted the cup to be removed, yet he submits his desire to the will of God. Jesus refused to have his will be in opposition to the Father's will. You know, God never tells us in his word that his will is easy. <coughs> But his will is always perfect, and it cannot be improved upon in any way. Martin Luther King Jr. shared this about doing God's will. I still believe that standing up for the truth of God is the greatest thing in the world. This is the end of life. The end of life is not to be happy. The end of life is not to achieve pleasure and avoid pain. The end of life is to do the will of God, come what may. You know, we can't comprehend the depth of Jesus' agony. But we can learn from Jesus how to respond when we face very difficult situations. After praying for about an hour, Jesus returns to Peter, James, and John. However, we see in verses 37 through 40, they keep falling asleep. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Now, Jesus may have addressed Peter first because we saw back in uh, earlier in the chapter, in uh, both verse 29 and verse 31, Peter vowed his allegiance to Jesus. So he basically is saying, I'm spiritually strong. I will not turn away from you. And yet he needs to be praying at this point in time, and yet he keeps falling asleep. Now, when Jesus comes to the disciples, He's coming because of his concern for them. Jesus isn't asking the disciples to watch and to pray for him, but for themselves. Look at verse 38. Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Now, this is amazing. It shows you how other-centered Jesus was. He's experiencing this great agony as he's looking forward to the cross. <coughs> And yet he is concerned for his disciples. So when he comes back, he wants them to be alert and praying because of what they're going to be facing in a short time. He knows that they need spiritual strength to face the temptations that are ahead. Now, Jesus' mild rebuke was never to shame the disciples, but to strengthen them. He wants them to, to stand tall. We can't avoid all the temptations of life. Some we can avoid, but we can't avoid all of them. So he says, keep watching and praying. These are both present imperatives. So in other words, this is ongoing. This isn't something that you just prepare for once in a while, but the idea is that this spiritual alertness and prayer is something that should be a part of our lives. In a very short time, the disciples are going to be faced with Jesus' arrest and his death. Are they going to be prepared for what's going to take place? You know, 
none of us know the challenges that we are going to face in the days ahead. But we do know that we need to be spiritually alert and prayerful each day so that we will be living in dependence upon the Lord. Think back to 9-11. There were many people working in those two twin towers. Some of them were believers and some of them were not. But none of them had any idea what was coming. And when those planes struck those towers, those who were believers did not have time to be prepared spiritually. Now well, that needed to be something that was ongoing in their lives. At midday on September 21st, 2013, Al-Shabaab Nelton stormed Nairobi's premier Westgate shopping center, throwing grenades and firing indiscriminately at shoppers. The subsequent siege lasted 80 hours and resulted in at least 67 deaths. The people shopping and eating at that uh, shopping mall had no idea about what was to take place. They needed to be prepared spiritually in every situation. You know, we don't usually face these severe kinds of situations, and yet we need to be spiritually alert and in prayer so that we are able to face the, the temptations and the challenges that are in this life, in this fallen world. We never know what today or tomorrow or the next day will hold. But the Lord is the same each and every day. And we need to be connected with him to face whatever situations that might be there. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 38 that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, the human spirit may want to do the right thing, but your human body is weak. So spiritual alertness and prayer, independence upon the Lord, provides us the only adequate preparation for any crisis or situation that we might face. We see here in this passage that Jesus was preparing for the intense trial that was ahead of him. He was alert and he was prayerful. And he gave his disciples and he gave us the right example to follow. But even though Jesus exhorted his disciples to be alert and to pray, what did they do? They kept falling asleep. It says that they didn't know how, what to answer Jesus. My guess is they were probably ashamed. He's telling them, you need to pray to face what's coming. And yet they fell right back to sleep. They were the ones who had just boasted earlier that none of them were going to deny Jesus. And yet we will see that they all run away from him when Jesus is arrested. They were spiritually weak, but they thought they were strong. And when, we're, when we think we're spiritually strong, then we are not going to pray like we should. The more we understand our weakness, the more dependent we will be on the Lord. Unfortunately, the sleepy disciples lost their opportunity to gain strength through prayer because they slept through this time. In contrast to Jesus, who was prepared for what was ahead. Let's look at verses 41 and 42. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now we notice here that Jesus makes it clear that he knows that the possibility of escaping the hour will not happen. Now here the hour may point to the beginning of what is going to take place with his arrest. He's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus realized that Judas is on his way with the religious leaders to seize him. Now, in verse 42, the New American Standard translates that, let us be going. However, it might better, a better translation might be, let us advance to them. Because when you say, let us be going, the natural thought might be, well, let's get out of here. They're coming, so let's go. 
But what is Jesus saying? No, we're going to them. He wasn't running away. No, he was going to meet them because he knew this was part of God's plan. And he was committed to doing God's will, not to run away from God's will. William Lane shared this. Just as rebellion in the garden brought death's reign over man, of course he's referring back to Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they rebelled against God, which resulted in death. Submission in Gethsemane reversed that pattern of rebellion and sets in motion a sequence of events which defeated death itself. So he's contrasting the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and that led to death. Jesus faced it in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he was willing to obey God's will, which was going to then overcome death and defeat death. Let's thank Jesus that he did not run from the cross. It brought un unbelievable agony to him, but he was committed to doing God's will. And of course, we've all received the blessing that Jesus went to the cross for us. Jesus gives us a perfect example in this passage to follow. Not only do we learn from Jesus to confront temptation with prayer, but we also learn that prayer is not a means of bending God's will to our will, but it's bending our will to God's will. I would encourage each one of us to develop a lifestyle of being spiritually alert and having a life of prayer and dependence upon our Heavenly Father. Let's set aside time to talk to Him in prayer. And also as we go about our daily living, let's talk to Him in prayer as a way of life. As we're living this life, let's ask God for the wisdom that we need, the strength that we need to face whatever situations that come across our path. Let's also commit ourselves to doing God's will no matter what the cost, and trust in Him for the strength to do what He's called us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your wonderful plan that's provided salvation for us. It's hard at times to realize how much Jesus <coughs> suffered for us. We didn't have to go through that suffering because he faced it. He was the one who was willing to take upon himself the sins of the world. He was the one who was willing to have your righteous wrath poured out upon him as he paid the penalty for our sins. When we think about what Christ has done for us, our own, only reasonable response is to give ourselves to him, to live for him. And Father, we thank you that even though we may face some very difficult situations in this life, we thank you that you always provide us the strength that we need. However, we must choose to depend upon you. <coughs> May we walk in dependence upon you so that you would truly be glorified through us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.